Well, thank you. As Carolyn said, we've been out all week. We've been to Derry, London, Derry, Armagh, Enniskillen, and um, we've had a great week. And the reason why we've had a great week has actually been because of the energy and enthusiasm that has come out of the um, industry. It's, it's been very, very rewarding because um, Northern Ireland, as we said, has been on a great food journey. Um, and what a week. Uh, did you hear the news about Belfast being listed in the top 10 foodie places to visit on Wednesday by National Geographic, which is absolutely superb. Um, so getting into the top 10 with National Geographic and getting Rory Best as captain of Ireland, eh? We've actually got an idea. Carolyn had an idea for a duck. She did, I thought she was going to tell Howard. We say, I said, we'll have to have a Rory Best duck. And she said it can be a Rory Breast. But <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not telling them that joke. <laughs> so we, we're going, it's easy to stand up here and say um, we're going through a food revolution. But I just wanted to show you a few figures that hopefully um, will endorse that. Um, and explain why we toddled up the hill here in January 2013 to talk to Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill. And to give them their due, uh, they both welcomed the idea really, really warmly. And they, along with people like uh, Jonathan Bell and David Simpson, who helps us host uh, showcases in the House of Commons, and actually breakfast as well, Ulster, an Ulster Fry in the House of Commons now is, is something else. Um, and they have been a fantastic uh, support. But the reason really why we were able to persuade them was that we were able to show them some uh, statistics. And it wasn't just the statistics about, uh, you know, Northern Ireland exports four and a half billion pounds worth of food, which, you know, we've all, we all know um, Northern Ireland has always been a bigger, or in recent times, has always been a bigger exporter of beef and milk than Scotland. Um, it's always supplied something like 20% of the beef in supermarket shelves in England in recent times. Um, but unfortunately, it's been quite a commoditized industry. And um, until about 10 years ago, uh, we were selling a lot of stuff, but nobody knew it was coming from Northern Ireland. And I remember um, about seven years ago that uh, uh, an organization, a government organization called Food From Britain, they did a study into Northern Ireland and they compared the structure of our industry with other, uh, with other regions of the UK that were comparable. And they said to us at that time, you know, there's, this is quite strange. Um, you've got a lot of big suppliers and you've got some small suppliers, but you've got hardly any medium-sized suppliers. And when you compare that with other regions in the rest of uh, GB, that, that's quite, uh, quite unusual. But, but the good news is it's all changed. And there's a lot of food award organisations, but probably this, the... Um, I suppose the most prestigious one in the UK and Ireland is the Guild of Fine Food, and they run the Great Taste Awards. In fact, they ran it in this room in, in 2013, and I'll come to that in a minute. And it was started by a gentleman called John Farrand, and we had him over a few years ago, and he just couldn't believe the change in Northern Ireland. He was at Balmoral, and he said, you know what, he said, 10 years ago, we couldn't even award a supreme champion for Northern Ireland. I mean, there were a few good products, but there wasn't enough of a mass for us to say, to pick, to pick somebody out as a region. But all that changed, and um, I just wanted you to look at these figures, and these were the figures that we showed to the ministers. So, from the Great Taste Awards in 2012, we had 46 local companies who awarded to, were awarded 206 gold stars for their entries. Now, just to give you a bit of uh, an idea of the scale of that, Around 2012, there were probably 7,500 entries from across the UK and Ireland into the Great Taste Awards. And the way they are judged is there are 400 expert judges. Um, the product is taken out of its, of its packaging. It's prepared by Hotel Kitchen and it arrives on the plate. Uh, you don't know where it's from. You don't know which part of the United Kingdom it's from, who made it. And all you get is a description such as a plum and vanilla jam or uh, you know, a salt aged beef. Um, so we had a great success in 2012 because not only did we have 46 local companies getting the 200 stars and six got a three star rating, which is probably only about uh, two or three percent of the entries. Um, but we also had a supreme champion in 
uh, Northern Ireland, and he covered that was for the whole of the UK and Ireland, and that was McCartney's in Moira, and they won it with a uh, corned beef made from Silverside. In 2013, uh, 65 local companies entered, and they were awarded 237 gold stars for their entries. And now, bear in mind, about 20% of entries get a gold star. 13 products achieved a three-star rating. And again, we had the supreme champion for the whole of the UK and Ireland, and that was Peter Hannan, again from Moira. It must be something to do with the Yarra Moira. But um, he won it with a, a guanciale made from local pork. Um, 2014, now we're looking at see how it's going up. Uh, the great news was that the Great Taste Awards were actually judged in this room. And we had uh, a lot of food celebrities here. We had people like Nigel Barden, Charles Campion, Xanthi Clay, um, and a lot of top chefs and the food, top food buyers, people from Harrods, Sportman Masons, and they all came to Belfast. They had a great time. We showed them around some producers uh, and took them to restaurants in Belfast as well. But at that stage, with 101 local companies got 351 gold stars and 18 products got a three star rating. And I think was that the year that Mark Mark did you get your did you get your one star for potato apple that year? Yeah, that was a great that was a great star to get, Mark. Apple potato got a one star, which was which was fabulous. Um, the the awards went back to England in uh, 2015, so there weren't as many um, entries. But the top product from Northern Ireland in 2015 was Baron Court's Estate Seek of Venison. So these were the sorts of figures that we. Um, took to the ministers and also to the agriculture minister. We went and we said, look, you've also got three products of geographic indication in Northern Ireland with the Armagh Bramley apples, the Loch Ness eels, and the Cumber early potatoes. And the PGI status is, is very difficult to secure. It's the equivalent of getting um, an Appalachian Control A. People like uh, Champagne and Parmaham have it. But we also went and said, look, there's no point in having this and hanging the certificate in the wall. You know, we have to do something with it. Um, so, uh, the, the ministers backed us. Um, at that stage, we were working away, producing our guides, working, with, working at Balmoral Show. Um, we were very lucky this year. Our guides won a world award. Um, our Taste of Ulster guides, which have got thicker and thicker as the years have gone on. Our producer's guide has got thicker and thicker. And as Carolyn said, we've produced a drinks guide. But the other thing that was starting to happen as well was we were starting to build up a events calendar in Northern Ireland and probably one of the first things that we started with was the Balmoral Food Pavilion and with the words of food from, from Britain echoing in our ears we started it in 2008 with six local companies by 2013 we had 60 local producers by 2014 we had 85 local producers and this year we'll have or sorry and last year we had almost 100 plus we had 40 chefs who came in and demonstrated but what shocked us more than anything was that uh, of the 90 to 100 producers there, 45 of them would have started up within the last five years. So the first time in our office that we got a farmhouse cheese, we were giving each other high fives. You know, God, rapeseed oil, yeah, farmhouse cheese is great, new product. Ice creams came along, ciders came along, and beers came along. And goat meat came, and lots of different innovation. Very, very rewarding. and. Um, have to put in a plug for Balmoral. It's the one place you should go if you want to get a really good overview of artisan food in Northern Ireland. And out of things like Balmoral Span, Legendary Food Festival, Cumber Early Potato Festival, Flavours of the Foil, um, and then the calendar started to come together. So whenever we were um, sitting down and putting together the 12 months, we tried to build on the strengths of things that were already happening. So for March, we originally started out with St. Patrick's, but then we moved on to Heritage and Traditions, building on the good work that was happening up in Derry with uh, Legendary, where they got 36,000 visitors in to see um, an artisan food festival. So the idea of the calendar is that it's not meant to be um, restrictive, but it's meant to be there to give you some structure to work around. The other things that started to change were um, the restaurants started to get uh, external accreditations and it's been fantastic to get the Michelin stars this year. The AAA rosettes which are equivalent to a Michelin star, fantastic. Just keen to see more, sorry Belfast, but keen to see more of them in other parts of Northern Ireland as well. And appreciate that that doesn't happen overnight. Um, 
I mean, what stood out to me personally about the uh, Michelin stars were that the people that won those worked directly with farmers. So, for example, um, Ox got a Michelin star, but it works with uh, the Dunleys out at Ballywalter to raise cattle. And um, Epic got a Michelin star, and they work with Hannans and Glenarm Estate, where they raise the cattle. And it's those things, it's those sort of basic food traditions that are so important and what we need to celebrate. I remember a long time ago, I worked in Invest NI and I used to bring in, I used to work with trade missions and I remember the first time an American trade mission came in and they asked me, was the beef grass fed? And I must admit, I looked at them as if, what? <laughs> you know, what else would it be? But of course, if you're in America, you're paying a premium for grass-fed beef because the majority of cattle don't actually see um, the light of day. And I remember asking somebody as well, um, you know, this is a guy up at, uh, and a lecturer up at um, the University of Ulster in Korean, and I said to him, you know, what is Northern Ireland, you know, really strong at? And he said, well, we're actually world class at growing grass. Oh, fair enough. We said that that's why you get such good beef and such good dairy. Um, the other thing that we're fantastic at is, is the breads. And I think we tend to forget that when visitors come here, they really want to taste the griddle breads. And the griddle breads are unique to the region. I know that James Street South had 25 or 30 Norwegians in that wanted to learn how to make soda bread because it was a tradition from their country that they could remember their grandparents making, but it had, had disappeared. I remember the time as well, Mark, that we went down to the World Peace and Fire Games. Mark and I managed to get a gas canister into Belfast City Airport. And if that's not an easy, that's not an easy task. And he fired up his griddle and he welcomed people from all over the world, from Venezuela and Brazil. There was the Colombian Ladies Correctional Centre football team. I was terrified of them. <laughs> <laughs> there was a group of Malaysian bodybuilders who wouldn't eat the bread if it had butter on it, but they would eat the bread without butter. And then there was a group of Russians and all they wanted to know was where's the bar. <laughs> Um, but as we said earlier, the, um, the whole drinks thing has just taken off and it's been absolutely fantastic. We just published a little guide, I think with 28 uh, now drinks producers in it. And when we started, really, we would have struggled to think of more than two or three drinks producers. And recently we had over um, some drinks riders and we took them to Rich Hill and we took them to an Armagh Bramley Apple Festival. And we got them to meet the people who have the orchards who grow the cider. And they were really, really impressed. There's a guy called Pete Brown, and he writes for the Daily Mail, and he also writes a book about beers, and, he wrote a book about beers and ciders. And he took me to one side and he said, this is a really amazing cluster of cider makers you have here. I was going, right. Um, and he said, uh, well, first of all, he said, they're the only cluster of cider makers I know that still make cider from apple juice. They don't make cider from concentrate. He said, they're the only group of cider makers I know that will make cider from a single variety and put a Bramley apple in a cider. And thirdly, he said, you know, they're, they're about the only group, group as well I know that will actually tell you what's in the bottle. So when you stand in the middle of Rich Hill surrounded by WIs and the apple tart competition, you know, I was thinking, this is all very romantic, but I wonder, does he really think that? And a week later, he sent me an article out of, an, um, out of a trade publication uh, that maybe Terry, you might know, it's called Publican News. I always can remember it because of Republican News, but it's definitely Publican News. <laughs> and um, he'd, he'd actually entitled his article, you know, why don't you, have you thought of sourcing cider from Northern Ireland? And if you th are looking to source cider, you know, you can't go far wrong. So we're starting to get international recognition. Um, as um, Hard said, we've got a lot of authors, some people who won uh, awards as well this year were Viola Donna, uh, uh, an author from Fermanagh, Emmett McCourt, uh, a chef from Derry who wrote a book, Feast and Famine, uh, Noel McMeal from Fermanagh who wrote Irish Pantry, I have to get that right, and Paula McIntyre um, as well. So we're starting to really get onto an international uh, page in a place that we weren't where before. And if you're asking me, what's different about Northern Ireland in 2016 and what the opportunity is. From our point of view, it's that getting onto the radar of the journalists, bringing in the key influencers, winning over the media and bringing in lots of chefs. 
So this year, one of, one of the things that we want to do, and we need your help with as well, is we want to bring in uh, top chefs, not necessarily just the TV presenters and the poster boys, um, not necessarily uh, just the likes of um, the very gorgeous Donald Skehan from the south of Ireland, who my daughter, who's 17, picked his book off the shelf in Easton and said, Mummy, could you not get him to come to Northern Ireland? Uh, but the ones that have actual serious, serious influence on the industry and how they think. Um, for, so, for example, here's another group we had in. We had in Charles Campion, and um, we want the ones that are influencers over the rest of the media, but we want the ones as well and pair them to an event or a product. So what I'm trying to say is, rather than just getting a general writer to go to somewhere like the Killyle Chocolate Festival, we've been working with Maeve, and we've linked them into a chef called Marc de Marquette, who's linked to the Academy of Chocolate. So we're really trying to, to tightly pair. And that's why we need your ideas, and that's why we need you to tell us what's happening this year. At the other end of the food chain, we've had a lot of support from uh, the farmers and some very significant things that they're doing as well. They contacted us and asked us, could they do <laughs> car stickers or tractor stickers? So they've printed 5,000 tractor stickers. Um, much to our surprise, they also wanted armbands for Ulster Farmers Union. And um, the, don't take the purple one because it says we braid. We find that one's not so popular. <laughs> but... Um, I think, I think what I'm trying to say is the story's getting out there. Um, <laughs> as as uh, Catherine sa or um, as Carlin said early, earlier, we've got great support from Tesco, but if you also look at the leaflets that are coming through your door from the likes of Spar and Super Value and Lidl, you'll see that they're also following the themes for a year of food and drink. So everybody's getting together to try to define what the food magic is for Northern Ireland. Now, Hard talked about a finale, and that's my other challenge to you today. I really would love to see a finale in Belfast uh, towards the end of the year. And Wendy knows that I'm not a fan of the continental market. Um, I'm a believer that we now have a good enough food industry that we should be showcasing our own food. And I can't understand why we can't celebrate something from our own culture. Um, a number of years ago, I went to Portsmouth with my daughter to look at university and it was at Christmas time and they do a Dickensian Christmas market and it's just fabulous. You would never go to Disneyland if you've seen this Dickensian Christmas market. Everybody dresses up in Victorian costume, they carry little oil lamps through the town and they all act out different characters in Charles Dickens novels because Dickens was born in Portsmouth. And what I would love to see in Belfast would be something like, um, I don't know, a C.S. Lewis market. Not so sure if that would work with drinks companies but it's an idea or a Jonathan Swift uh, market, because Jonathan Swift was inspired to write Gulliver's Travels because of the view of Cave Hill. Um, by the way, does anybody realize that Jonathan Swift stayed in places like Glock Gall and all over? But if you go to all these places, they all have to tell you that they all tell you that they built a separate house for Jonathan Swift. But that's, that's another story. You'll have to take me out to tell you the reason for that. Um, or a Samuel Cleland Davison market, because the man who started the Sirocco Works didn't just convent air conditioning. He actually broke the tea monopoly that India and China had. And he was the first person to invent drying machinery, which meant that tea could be um, brewed outside of those countries, or, or tea wasn't just monopolized by those countries. So when you go into your workshops, love you to look at the calendar themes, want you to um, think about a finale for the year. And I'm just going to finish by showing you one of the films on our YouTube channel. And I'll throw that out to you as well. Uh, keen for ideas for our YouTube channel. We started it about a year ago. Some films have been really, really popular. In fact, we put out one this week or last week for Skinny Malinkies, and I think I got 7,000 views. But um, I'm just going to show you the one that was done for Loch Ness Eels because mm. I think that uh, it's just a great story and um, hopefully you'll enjoy it as well. My name is Martin Devlin, and my son is Ryan. Ryan is probably the eighth generation of, of the Devlin family who have fished. I'm very proud to say that as well. Um, we've been fishing on the low an awful long time. 
The wonderful thing about this lock is it's, it's 154 square mile and you get panoramic views of, of five of the six counties of Ulster. And I mean, some of the sunsets and sunrises you get are fantastic. And you get all the mood changes of weather. You're gonna have an absolutely gorgeous day and a, and a front comes in and the waves are beating on you. And you know, it's great work when there's loads of eels and you're doing well. But when you come out and it's stormy and it's cold and you're not doing that well, it's very tough work. Being a fisherman is a bit like being a farmer. I mean, you need to have, you need a bit capable of doing many things in terms of most farmers are, are capable of, of doing all the service and the tractors and machinery or whatever. On, on the same, we have to keep our boats up and we have to keep the tackle and whatever. So over the course of years, you, you, you learn the trades. Six months of the year we fish for eels, but the other six months of the year, my son and I are both carpenters. So we're carpenters and fishermen. I love eels slow, fried in a pan. Give them loads of time to leach the oil out of them. Um, I find that some people actually cook them very, very quickly, and what it does, it, it seals a lot of the oil in there, and this can be very heavy on the stomach. But if you slowly cook them, that's what I've been used to. That's the traditional method that always was used. I mean, you don't even need oil in the pan. There's that much oil in these. And the great thing about them, you know, they're, they are high in omega-3. They are the brain food for, to feed your children. So anybody who's watching this video, get yourself some meals, and you're doing yourself, and you're doing the community, and you're doing your children a, wonder, a wonderful power of good because you're feeding them something natural. So, so let's do ourselves a wonderful par of good. Thanks very much. Um, so I just want to let you know that um, we're not chasing you out today. Um, there's tea and coffee served outside, and basically you can stay and play as long as you, you want. I just I wanted to give some thank yous. Obviously, we started off with, with Jay and Stephanie for a fantastic breakfast. Um, and I know that um, everywhere we've been this week, we've had fantastic hospitality and fantastic food. Um, I'd like to thank um, Hard Hastings, who's had to, to, to go, a busy man, um, for speaking today, and also Michelle Sherlow um, for coming out and her team as well for supporting us. And just for my own team at Tourism NI, the events company and Jonathan and Corporate AV who make all this happen. So thank you very much. And um, I'd also like to thank the people from outside Belfast, but somebody had mentioned to me there's quite a lot of people have come from Arts and Parts to, to uh, share with today who maybe couldn't get to the other events. So thank you very much. And please keep out, look out for the calendar. And um, we will be doing more um, fun and just good luck in your own businesses and uh, tea coffees outside. Thank you very much.